It's a perfectly natural question. What are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? If I were to ask others this question, I would no doubt receive an array of responses. I'm a brother, an uncle, and a husband. I'm a gay man, a survivor of bullying, a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and a veteran of an AIDS epidemic that left me physically unscathed but mentally and spiritually scarred. One poet said that I'm a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. Another has said that I am made in the image of God. I am a published author, a reluctant activist, and a minister. And if I were to ask you, what do you mean when you say I am a minister, I would get another string of responses. You might say it means that I'm supposed to be available 24-7. Or you might feel it's not such a bad gig being as how I preach on Sunday and I'm free the rest of the week. Others might think, but never actually say out loud that I'm the church administrator, the custodian, and the groundskeeper. And still others will tell you, I'm the guy who visits them in the hospital or nursing home. But if you were to ask people who I encounter during the week, they would probably say fulfilling my role as minister means they have food to eat from our outdoor pantry and a soft drink or cold water if they're thirsty. Or if you're HIV positive, I'm the guy who delivers food to your doorstep and assures you Everything's going to be okay if you keep taking your meds. In this morning's text, Jesus also wanted to know what the scuttlebutt on the streets was. Who do people say that I am, he asked his disciples. It's helpful to know that in Jewish tradition, it's believed that with the return of Elijah, he will announce the coming of the Messiah and the redemption of Israel. And Mark's Gospel opens with the depiction of John the Baptist taking on that role. So when the people saw Jesus as John the Baptist, or as Elijah, or as any other prophet, they saw him as someone pointing to the arrival of the Messiah. But Peter said Jesus wasn't pointing to the Messiah, but was in fact the Messiah the very one all Jews had been waiting and hoping and praying for. In Matthew's Gospel, Peter is praised for his answer and awarded the keys of the kingdom, but not so in Mark's Gospel. In fact, things get rather tense between Jesus and Peter, with all the rebuking going on between the two of them, just as people see my role as a minister from very different perspectives, Peter and Jesus saw Jesus' role as Messiah as differently. For Peter, like most of the Jewish people, Messiah referred to a military hero, a political figure, someone who would overthrow Rome and establish a new kingdom which would be the beginning of the kingdom of God. But Jesus paints a very different picture, saying the human one, or the Son of Man, would undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And if anyone wanted to follow him, they had to be willing to go through the same humiliating experiences. Because this form of death reserved for slaves, prisoners of war, and political rebels was indeed a humiliation. It was a public degradation in which their clothing was confiscated and their torture and execution in, in the nude served as a form of entertainment for the masses. And this was definitely not 
what Peter had signed up for. So who is Jesus? Ask people today and you'll find that everyone has an opinion. From the preacher to the 20-something podcaster. From your mama to your hairdresser. You might be told that Jesus is the incarnation of God or or our personal Lord and Savior or our friend or the sacrifice for our sins. Or you might hear that he was a rabbi, a revolutionary, or a prophet. Something known as High Christology says Jesus knew from the start exactly what was happening and death on the cross was his mission from day one. Low Christology says Jesus knew that the things he was teaching were not going to be tolerated. It says he knew and even provoked conflict that led to his death. But the teaching and community he built was the mission, not his death. I believe that Jesus was and is a different person to different people. We all are. His relationship to Mary and Martha and Lazarus was different than his relationship to the 5,000 people who were fed by him. The Syrophoenician woman who knelt before him begging for a cure for her daughter saw Jesus differently than Mary who knelt before him and anointed his feet with expensive perfume. And furthermore, ideas about Jesus change over time. When Peter or Mary Magdalene thought of Jesus while he was alive, that changed when they encountered him again after his death. I think we tread on dangerous ground when we impose our beliefs about Jesus upon others. You see, that's the mistake Peter makes in this morning's scripture. He believed Jesus was supposed to lead them to victory. He was so sure of his belief, after all, it was written right there in sacred scripture, that he felt it his obligation to correct Jesus's misguided sense of direction. Now that's some chutzpah when you go to correcting Jesus. But Jesus demands that Peter get back in line, in essence, telling him to let Jesus do the leading. And if we were to let Jesus do the leading and the Holy Spirit do the guiding for us today, we might come to discover some important things. We might learn that the spiritual freedom experienced by the gay man, the lesbian, or the bisexual who are in a relationship with Jesus may be very different than the spiritual freedom experienced by the heterosexual. The compassion that God offers to the transgender person is different from that of the cisgender person, regardless of what you may have been told. Different because different people have different needs. The point I'm trying to make is God is too big to be confined by any one belief system. If we are certain that God hates all the same people that we hate, if nothing that Jesus said makes us uncomfortable and we rest in the assurance that we've got it all figured out, if we cling with a white-knuckled grip to our image of God, then friends, we are spiritually doomed. Thomas Merton was an American Trappist monk best known for his many writings on topics ranging from prayer and contemplation to war and racism. If there is anyone I would think knew God, it would have been him. And yet this is his prayer he wrote. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. 
nor do I really know myself. And that I think I am following your will does not mean I am actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you will never leave me to face my perils alone. May his prayer be our own. May we all hold on loosely to the image of Jesus, but never let go. May we honor the experience as a sacred one of others in their quest for the divine. And finally, may we be open to the possibility that we've got a lot to learn if we ever hope to fully know Jesus. Amen. Oh,